Hello and welcome to the Gentleman's Scholars Club. In today's video, we'll be doing a review of the Permanent Style Bridge Coat, created by Simon Crompton of PermanentStyle.com and produced in collaboration with the British company Private White VC, who are known for their outerwear at their Manchester, UK factory. When it was originally released around October 2018, the Private White Permanent Style Bridge Coat was intended to be a very limited edition. It has since come back year after year to great acclaim. If you take a look at the original article in which the coat was introduced, you'll see that as of today, there are more than 200 comments in a very lively comment section testifying to the continued popularity of the coat. And whenever it's released in the fall winter collection on both the private white website and the permanent style web shop, it sells out inevitably. Thus, the coat has become a true staple or core item for both permanent style and private white. Personally, I was on the fence about this coat for several reasons, and I, I made for myself a list of pros and cons, which I'll share with you right now. First of all, I usually wear longer coats, uh, wool or wool cashmere, that end roughly at my knee or lower. That's kind of a, a style I like. However, I was honest with myself and, re and realized that I do tend to overdress, and so I was looking for something that was a bit more casual and that I could dress down, something I could wear with knitwear like this or with jeans. I could do that with a longer polo coat, but it would be easier with something shorter, and a pea coat came to mind since I had worn pea coats in the past. Uh, the thing is, though, that pea coats can be found for considerably less than the price of the bridge coat. If you look at a department store or Brooks Brothers, or even if you go to a more a niche menswear retailer like Suit Supply or the Canadian Spear and McKay, you'll find pea coats for roughly $300 to $400. Uh, if you go to a department store, you might even find them for considerably less. The price for the bridge coat was 1100 US, including shipping. Uh, Private White also offers customs insurance where you pay an additional amount to offset the risk of paying higher customs. And if I had taken that option, it would have been roughly $1,350 US. I ultimately didn't choose that, and so I paid around 1100 all in. Uh, however, the range would then be 1100 to around 1350 if you chose to go with this coat in US dollars. I did pull the trigger on the coat, and there are several reasons why. Ultimately, if you go back to that original article in which Simon is modeling the coat, the photography of Jamie Ferguson is really outstanding. It really makes the coat sing, makes it seem like a thing of beauty, which it is. I realize that there is a lot of artistic skill, photographic talent that goes into making those shots look good, as well as post-processing. However, the beauty of those images really stuck in my mind, and even though it took me a couple of years to pull the trigger, uh, it was something that I constantly found myself returning to look at on the Permanent Style website. Secondly, if you consider the cost over time, the investment isn't that bad. Now, think of this as an investment piece. You can certainly wear it for a decade or more. If you wear it regularly and give it an average to good care, it should last you for that period of time. Um, if you buy something for less, like something from Brooks Brothers or a department store, you may not be as satisfied with it. You might find it too short, too boxy. The quality of the material, the quality of the buttons may not be as good, and you'll find yourself buying another coat, uh, either another one from them, or you might even ultimately come back to this coat when you could have bought it in the first place. So the best rule of thumb, uh, the best practice, is to buy the best quality thing you can for as much as you can afford. And it's usually a, a better idea to save up and get something good of high quality rather than buying something cheaper and then repeating that process several times, or again, even just ending up with the coat you could have had from the beginning. Beyond that, this coat features a plethora of tailoring details that really make it stand out without being ostentatious. And when you have an item of quality, when you have something that's artisanal, when you know that a lot of effort and, and energy and care has been put into making that piece of clothing, when you wear it, you feel a certain sense of pride and confidence that you wouldn't have if you buy something ready to wear just off the rack from a department store. So that feeling is sort of the intangible behind it, and overall I would recommend purchasing this coat. However, when I was trying to make a decision on whether or not to get it, I found there was a definite lack of reviews, and certainly no videos, very few images of the coat in the wild. I think there were actually no images I can find in Google of it being worn in, in, or in action. I think there were a few of someone who had bought it uh, just hanging on a, on a hanger, but there was nothing with someone in the coat walking around. So I thought I'd make this video uh, in some small way to remedy that and show you the features of the permanent style bridge coat. 
So this is the permanent style bridge coat, and I think the first thing your eyes notice are the dramatic lapels, which catch your attention at the front of the coat. Uh, they are large and in charge, certainly not something you will normally find in a run-of-the-mill pea coat at a department store. Wearing the bridge coat this way is the most casual you can do it, with the lapels flat and the front unbuttoned. I highly recommend, though, popping the collar. I think any overcoat benefits from a popped collar. A pea coat or a bridge coat not accepted. If you look at it from the side, you see how the popped collar brings the lapels along with it and gives you that dramatic silhouette uh, when seen from an angle. This is still fairly dressed down. The front is open and it's, it's, uh, you can wear it with knitwear or, and or jeans to give it that casual, to retain that casual style. I personally like to wear the bridge coat in a way that gives a nod to its historic and nautical roots. Uh, so I'm wearing a cable knit with a turtleneck and with a pop collar. Uh, this is kind of like the way seafaring men would wear it in the past. Bridge coat is originally something that was worn by officers rather than enlisted men. The greater length of the bridge coat uh, is typical of the style, though the historical bridge coat was longer, running down to the knee. Uh, but this bridge coat still lives up to its name because it's longer than the standard pea coat and it was designed this way in order to enable it to cover tailoring so that the bottom of your tailored jacket would not peek out below the hemline of the bridge coat. Certainly you can button the bridge coat and I'll show you three ways you can do that. Uh, the first, the most conventional, and usually you would begin at the second button and go down one to button it, but this actually has three buttons. Uh, with the additional button at the shoulder. So you go down to the third button here, kind of at the lower chest, bring it across and fasten it like you would a double-breasted jacket. This is also the slimmest that you can make the bridge coat. And uh, I do feel it across my chest, though it's not super snug. And I'm wearing a fairly heavyweight cable knit sweater. And I also have an undershirt underneath. Certainly if you wear a shirt and a lighter weight sport coat, You'll easily accommodate those under the, the jacket and you would even be able to uh, wear a lightweight cardigan, for example, uh, quite comfortably. I've actually worn the bridge coat with a knit of this weight and a heavier jacket on top of that, something like a baby camel or a flannel sport coat. And I may have been a bit more stuffed into the coat, but I never felt uncomfortable. I was able to use my arms and have free range of motion. So you can really get a lot into here more than you might imagine. If you want to loosen it up a bit, you can do something a bit more unconventional and button it one lower, more down toward the waist. And uh, this frees up some space up here if you want to have that sort of breathing room. And then lastly, the third way to button it, which I won't be able to show you fully because I have a microphone on in my neck, is to bring everything up and kind of close, close it up around here. And the best time to do that is when you are in windy or stormy conditions. And this kind of acts like a, a throat latch and protects your neck, especially if you're not wearing a roll neck. Uh, when you do that as well, you enhance the military appearance of the coat because you can see the full glory of the buttons running up the side of the coat. Speaking of buttons, the conventional pea coat tends to have two rows of three buttons in kind of a parallel structure which can lead to a boxy appearance. When Simon designed this coat, he did so in a way that enhanced the dynamic movement at the front through the placement of the buttons. So the, the bottom buttons at the hips start a bit more widely. They narrow in here toward the waist and here, and then they broaden out at the chest. So you have this curved sweep that follows the curves of the lapels and also follows the overall cut of the jacket at the sides. And then you have the additional buttons that were added up here uh, that come back in again. So you have this kind of movement, symphonic movement of the, the coat. Now, speaking of the buttons, uh, these are also quite special. They are horn in a dark brown color. Uh, they're not at all like what you would find in a department store where you might get something like a, an embossed anchor detail. They're not ostentatious either. They're not white or brass or silver or something like that, which you can find in some pea coats. These are fairly low key. 
and not too showy, and yet they add a nice sartorial interest. They're muted and yet noticeable. And, and as Simon says, these are something that you would find in uh, a jacket made at, uh, or a coat made on Savile Row. In terms of the fit, um, there's not much I would do with it. I ordered a size 4 in Private White sizing, and the 4 is equivalent to a 40. I usually wear around a 38 to a 40, depending on the brand of jacket. My measurements are, I'm about 5 foot 11 and 165 pounds, and I found the 4 to be appropriate. I was thinking of perhaps trying a 5, but I found that the shoulders ended at about the right place. Uh, the sleeve length was good for me, and the length of the coat as well covered my tailoring and, and seemed to f finish at a good spot. So I didn't want to expand those dimensions uh, just to, to size up. Um, I do think that if there's one bit of alteration that I might do, it would be to let out the sides here where it's at its slimmest, and there is excess material, there's excess fabric here to do that. Didn't find it something urgent either, as I don't want to give up the jacket, and um, I may do so in the summer when I'm not wearing it on a regular basis, but I didn't find it urgent enough to uh, send to the tailor to do that. So I would recommend sizing according to what you normally wear, and note that private white sizing differs from the US or EU sizing systems. In the US, you would have 38, 40, 42. EU, you'd have 46, 48, 52, or 50, 52. Uh, Private White uses a smaller numbering system, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Um, again, the 4 is roughly a 40. I'll show you the, the back now. Um, up here is the first thing you might see if the collar is popped, and there are some copper rivets in both on both sides here doesn't really have a functional purpose, but it's a, a bit of attention to detail, adds some interest at the top. The action back is the most functional aspect of the coat at the rear, and I wasn't sure that this was necessary when I first saw it, but when I looked at the videos, I can see how uh, the action back, where you have some expanded fabric or extra fabric, really enables you to have a greater range of motion and more comfort when you move your arms or bend and move. So that's quite, quite a useful feature. And then down here you have a martingale style belt. It's simple. There are no buttons at the corners. It's non-functional. Again, just a, an aesthetic detail. And I think its simplicity is designed so that the back doesn't have too many button details. And some martingales do have buttons at the corner. Um, there are buttons running down the single vent at the middle. And these are the same style buttons as the front. And I always like to see an overcoat having buttons down the vent. Looking at the inside of the jacket, we have multiple pockets. Uh, this pocket I'll talk about a little more in a moment. But you have a large poacher's pocket here that runs really down into the, at, to the bottom of the, the, the coat. And the poacher's pocket was originally designed to put in game. So you're not necessarily going to be throwing a dead quail into here, but it has enough room for that or something like a tablet. On this side, you have uh, another small pocket that runs this way. Um, but it also goes in quite deep. I can sort of touch my ribs if I'm in this position. So the, the pockets are quite voluminous. And then back to this pocket, uh, it's quite special because not only is it, again, deep, but it's meant to be usable while the coat is fastened or buttoned up. Um, you put a cell phone in here, and you can stick your hand right into the pocket and retrieve it without having to unfasten the coat. So nice detail. Uh, in that department. Lastly, you have two hip pockets, and these are 100% cashmere lined. I believe all of the pockets are, but you most likely use the side pockets at the hip most often, and it really provides a luxurious and sumptuous feel. I would like to say that I recommend buying the coat or trying the coat just to get a feel of those pockets. It's a, a luxurious detail, something you appreciate when it's cold, and you stick your hands in there and you really get that cozy and comforting feeling from the pocket detail or from the cashmere. So I think that's about it for the features of the jacket. If you found the video useful, please like it. 
and feel free to follow us on YouTube for more information on classic men's style.